I think it's important to realize that memorizing the steps is, is only the beginning, and it's not even the most important part. Hi there, and welcome to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, episode 212. Today, I'm speaking with Sifu Jean Lukish, a Chinese arts practitioner from Boston. I don't want to spoil anything, but you're going to hear some names you'll definitely recognize in this episode. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the best podcast on traditional martial arts twice every week. Welcome. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning fans, and welcome to all of you new listeners. Did you see the latest issue of our newsletter? Over the last few weeks, we've sent out only a few. We never want to spam you. Inside each, we've included some really great stuff. Discounts, uh, including some more than 30% off. We've also made an announcement about new products, events, sparring gear colors, upcoming episodes, and more. Look, we all get a lot of emails, so we're careful at Whistlekick about what's going to go into hours. They're short, to the point, and from what we see in the numbers, people really like them. Sign up today at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com or whistlekick.com. It was from a recent conversation with an upcoming guest that I learned about Sifu Jean Lukish. After exchanging a few emails, I knew this would be one incredible interview. As the photos arrived featuring Sifu Lukic and everyone from Donnie Yen to Jackie Chan, it was really obvious that we were going to hear some great stories. Having trained under Bao Sim Mark, Donnie Yen's mother, Sifu Jean Lukic has ties to some incredible martial artists, but it was her passion and dedication that originally brought her to Boston. Rather than me telling her whole story, I'd rather you hear it directly from her. So let's welcome her to the show. Sifu Lukish, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Well, I appreciate your willingness to come on the show. And listeners, I'm just I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna give you just the slightest bit of of where this may go. Uh, as you may expect, there, there's an, are an, a number of emails that get exchanged back and forth before we record, and Sifu here sent me the most and the best photos of any guest in, in 200 plus episodes that anyone has ever sent me. <laughs> um, and let's just say one, two, three of the photos involve her with people that we have done profile episodes on. So that gives you an idea of where we may go today. But before we go anywhere, we've got to get a sense as to, to who you are and how you got there and, and you know, just Context. We, we need some context for everything else that we're going to talk about today. And I'm hoping you might indulge me with that and tell us how you got started as a martial artist. Um, okay. Uh, I, I, um, I started studying Tai Chi um, in 1976, and I was living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania then. And I did not really think of it as a martial art, but purely by accident, because there are weren't that many Tai Chi teachers, especially in Pennsylvania back then. I, I did end up with a teacher who who taught a little bit of the combat side, and I honestly wasn't sure how I felt about that. But at least from the beginning, I was exposed to the fa- fact that Tai Chi isn't just like a spiritual pursuit or a health exercise, but it also um, originated as a fighting art. And I, I had been studying in Pittsburgh for a couple of years. I think it was probably around the of 1978, a student came into the class talking about this Chinese woman who was teaching up in Boston and who was supposed to be really amazing. And and that kind of caught my attention because uh, my Pittsburgh teacher had said at one point that if it's at all possible, you should try to find a teacher with the same body type as you because that means they've already done a lot of the work of translating the movement for that body type. So I, I kind of said as a joke, well, that means I need to find a, a woman teacher, right? And he was like, you know, good luck with that because, you know, at that point I didn't even know of any women that were that were teaching. So I heard about this Chinese woman in Boston. And the other thing that I liked about that idea was that I, I was familiar with Boston. I had friends here and I thought, okay, maybe I'll just uh, go to Boston for a couple of years and learn some Tai Chi and then I can come back to Pittsburgh. And and so in, I think, July or August of 1978, I, I uh, planned a trip to Boston, visited my friends, and I had tracked down um, 
the Chinese woman that I heard about, and which was not easy because this was before the internet and everything. Right. I had to go to the yeah, I had to go to the local telephone office um, where they had uh, phone books for all the big cities around the country, and I actually went through the Boston Yellow Pages and wrote down all the names and phone numbers of the kung fu schools in Boston, and went home and started calling. And I think it was about the third one I called. The guy said, "Oh, I know who you're looking for," and her her school is the Chinese Wushu Research Institute. Um, and you know, I kind of wish I could go back and thank that guy again because you know that was nice of him. He was he had, you know he was a teacher at another school, and and yet he's He's steering me to the competition and, and through him, you know, I, I knew exactly where to go and I knew her name now, both and Mark. And so I, I went and visited her school when I was on my vacation in Boston, watched a class. And after that, I bought the t-shirt, paid the first month's tuition. I said, I'll be back at the beginning of September to start classes. And then I went and rented an apartment in Boston. <laughs> so when I went home to Pittsburgh, I told everybody, oh, I'm moving up to Boston at the end of the summer. And they were like, what? But it, it, it turned out to be just the most wonderful adventure. It was like the best decision I could have ever made. But the only thing that I, I hadn't realized was that um, I, I wouldn't be able to learn everything I wanted to learn in two or three years. <laughs> Fast forward, it's going to be, you know, I think 39 years this September. And, and I'm still um, I'm still working on trying to improve and, and advance my my uh, my art. But it was just the most amazing opportunity to walk in. And again, completely random. But here I walked into the school of one of the best martial artists in the world. Yeah. Now, now we've got to go back because there's a piece that that maybe the listeners are, are, are with me on this. Uh, and, and maybe, you know, I, I don't know why. Maybe you're glossing over this. Maybe you're not realizing it. Yeah. There aren't a whole lot of people that based on a brief conversation are going to relocate to train with someone. So I think that gives us an idea of how important your training was even before you moved to Boston. This wasn't just something you were doing casually. Uh, yeah, I would have said I was really serious about it. But then when I got to Boston, I realized that, that you know, what I was doing and what I was exposed to in Pittsburgh was just, you know, scratching the surface of the art that there was just so much more that I, I hadn't even realized. But yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I liked, I, I liked movement disciplines. I, I actually had studied pantomime before I went into Tai Chi. So that's why I say I wasn't a martial artist, but I did like doing physical disciplines and Tai Chi. I, I, I had seen a demonstration of it. And that's what sent me looking for a teacher. I just, I, I love the look of the movement. I, I, I just, it, there was like an aesthetic quality to it that really appealed to me. And, and like I said, I didn't make the decision to actually move until after I watched her teach a class. And, you know, it was like, if I can move like that, it's worth any sacrifice. Mm. Plus, you know, I was 28 years old. You know, when you're young, you can pick up and move someplace. It's not, I, I couldn't do that now. That's for sure. <laughs> What was now? Of, of course, for for listeners that might not be picking up what we're putting down with the name here, Sifu Mark. Of course, we've we've referenced on the show a few times in various episodes. Not only an amazing martial arts practitioner with with a tremendous history and and the respect of, I would guess anyone who's ever trained with her, but also the mother of Donnie Yen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and Donnie was in high school then. I think he was about like fifteen, sixteen years old. And so he was around, but you know, he was kind of, he had his his crew and you know, I I I hung out with some of the other students. But um but I, I actually what you were saying about how everybody respects her, one of the things that I've been doing with her school here in Boston, um, for the past two or three years is I'm in charge of organizing all the, the, the school events we do every five years, we have uh, uh, an anniversary celebration that celebrating the anniversary of the founding of our school in 1976. So every, every five years we do a big bash, like a whole weekend of events, seminars and performances, and of course a banquet. And, and then uh, on a yearly basis, we usually have a banquet. And so I, I reach out to a lot of our old students 
And um, I've tracked down people that, that has, have sort of been out of touch for a long time. And of course, they're always glad to hear uh, to hear from us and, and tried to get them to come back for some of these events. So I've talked to a lot of her um, old students and, and people that, that um, you know, studied with her over the years as private students and in her group classes and in her Boston University classes and, um, you know, uh, all the different places where she's taught. And every single person just has so much respect for her. Nobody ever has anything negative to say. And everybody talks about how she, she's one of the best teachers they've ever encountered. You know, it doesn't even matter what subject it is, just that she was able to tailor the information to the individual and, and she could see what you needed and how you needed to, to, to work on it in order to get where you wanted to go. And if you followed her instructions, um, you, you would you would find yourself advancing. And the reason I say if you followed her instructions is because sometimes it wasn't what you wanted to do. Um, it, it was funny because a lot of us realized back in the day, you know, people would come in and they just want competition wushu. They just want, you know, fighting techniques. And she'd say, no, you have to learn Tai Chi because you're too tight. You need to learn to relax. You need to learn to use your waist. And then there'll be people like me that just, you know, like peace and love hippie types that just, you know, wanted Tai Chi for fun. And she'd say, no, you have to do the long boxing. You have to do the Shaolin, do kicking drills, do punching drills. You know, you think you can do Tai Chi if you're so weak? No, you have to be strong to do Tai Chi. So sometimes it was the opposite of what you thought you came there for, but it was because she could see that if you really wanted to do this art correctly, you needed to, you needed to become a more well-rounded practitioner. You know, you can't just, just follow a narrow path to this goal. You have to like expand and, and absorb um, a lot of different skills and influences. So she was just really, really good at, at um, zeroing in on what each person needed and sometimes dragging them, kicking and screaming <laughs> <laughs> to the place where, you know, they needed to go. So, But everybody that, that stayed with her and that paid attention to, you know, what she was trying to show them realized that it was like, you know, like one of my friends called it. It's like it's a, it's a treasure box and, and she keeps pulling out treasures and giving them to you. It's like, wow, I got another treasure. But, you know, that's that's kind of the way it feels. She She could work at such a high level in her own skills and she could look at a complete beginner, no background at all and say, okay, this is what you need to do. And, and, you know, if you follow my directions someday, you'll be at this high level too. So it, it was just, you know, everybody still has these wonderful memories of, of just how stimulating and exciting it was to be part of her school. What was it like at that time learning from a woman? Because, I mean, obviously I'm not a woman. I've, I've never been a woman. I will never be one. But I know enough about martial arts to know that just gender-wise, we're not, we're not quite equal yet in terms of the percentage of practitioners and the percentage of instructors. And back then, I know it was even more lopsided. So what was that like for you as a female practitioner training with not just a woman, but someone who was so universally lauded? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, there's actually kind of maybe two parts to that response, and one is how Sifu had to deal with um, being, you know, pretty much the only woman kung fu teacher in Boston. And I, yeah, you know, I, I have heard stories about the kind of challenges that she had to deal with when she first opened her school. Uh, by the time I got there. Um, people were still coming in to challenge her, but at that point she had students that she could say, okay, you try my students first, and if you can beat them, then, then you get to try me. <laughs> and like one of my friends says, we'd take them out in the back alley and show them what's what, and they wouldn't come back. <laughs> so, yeah, but at first she really, you know, she had, to, she had to actually fight, and I've heard stories about that. In fact, just this past weekend I was talking, one of my students is a retired MIT professor who studied with her for a couple of years when she first opened her school, like 76 to 78. And, and he was talking about how people would come in and, and ask if they could try her skills. And, and he said, she wouldn't just knock them down. 
you would humiliate them. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're not going to try that again, are you? <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, she, she definitely had to deal with some stuff. And I think, I, I think even in the classes, sometimes, you know, she'd have to like sort of bring the guys down a peg or two, but, but, you know, again, she knew how to do it so that you, you felt the sting, but you still, you know, it, it, it still left you feeling utterly devoted to her. Um, now, as, as a as as a woman um, studying there, I, I know talking to, to some of the other women students, we would always say, at least we never have to worry about being the only woman in the class. You know, it's like that, that she had a lot of women students, obviously, you know, this was a draw. And so, uh, you know, most of the classes, there'd be almost 50% women. So it, it wasn't like you were isolated. And, you know, even if individual guys might be like, you know, trying to, you know, act like they're stronger than you and they can do more than you, uh, you always had Sifu there to back you up. Uh, I remember one time um, uh, we were practicing a counter where, uh, one person stands behind the other and gets them in a chokehold. And the guy that was doing it to me was not letting me respond with the counter that I was supposed to use. He was just tightening his grip and I couldn't make it work. And Sifu comes over to me and, you know, like hands on the hips and looking at me up and down. And then she says, okay, Jean, you know, she, she sort of slipped. Um, it, he was standing behind me with his right hand across my throat and she slipped my right hand like just inside the crook of his elbow and then she told me um hold my left arm in the embrace ball position which so I brought the left arm up in a curve and she said now turn to the left and I just turned and I heard the guy behind me go oh and my elbow had gone right into his stomach so like uh, she set me up and she said do this and it worked just perfectly so you know uh, she could always tell when you needed a little bit of help to kind of show people that yeah I can do this stuff I just you know sometimes need to practice first but it, it was it was a very sort of validating experience I think to be to be a woman in her school cool well, you've hinted it and already told some pretty good stories here on this show. It's all about the stories. Yeah. And I'm hoping you, yeah. you have, you know, maybe a longer form one that you'd care to share, your your favorite martial arts story. Um, for for me, my favorite story, I think, is that um, I, I, I'm a retired nurse. And uh, in the early 90s, I was working at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and um, it, it was a, a shift where there were four other nurses working with me on the floor, and we didn't have any nurses' aides. So it was just the five nurses taking care of everybody. And, and one of my nurse colleagues had a patient who had had surgery a few days before, and um, the doctor said it was time for this woman to get up out of bed because if you stay in bed for a long time, you get pneumonia, the fluids kind of collect in your lungs. So you, it's really important to get people up into a, a more upright position. But the problem was this, I, I'm going to not give too much information, you know, for patient confidentiality, but she was a, a very uh, big uh, an obese woman, an uh, excess of 300 pounds. And she only had one leg, the other, the, her left leg had been amputated at the knee. So in order to get her up out of bed, all five nurses went into the room and because I was the smallest one, they put me on her right side where the side where her leg was. We had her sitting on the side of the bed. I, I was standing beside her on the right, holding onto her right arm. There was another nurse on her left, holding her left arm. Uh, we put a walker in front of her with a nurse in front of the walker, bracing it. The idea was she was going to stand up, hold onto the walker, and then she was just going to pivot on her right foot, turn to face me. And there were two other nurses standing with a big reclining chair on her left, and they were just going to push that right up behind her, and she was going to sit down in it. So we had it all planned out, and we stood her up, and she started falling into me. And you know, nobody else could reach her. She was falling to the right. So what I did was I dropped right down into a horse step, a really low one where my thigh was parallel to the floor, with my knee behind her, my left knee behind her right knee, and using her right arm, I steered her down into a sitting position on my leg and, and kept her, you know, upright 
in, in balance over my leg and, and everybody like the walker is flying and the nurses are crawling over the chair trying to you know get at this woman to hold her up and I'm going it's okay it's okay I got her and finally all five of us surrounded her and we did a deadlift got her up into the chair you know put the 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 call light in reach and a sheet up under her chin and a glass of water at hand and we walk out of the room and one of one of my nurse colleagues says I just saw a miracle Jean held that woman up all by herself and I said that wasn't a miracle that was kung fu <laughs> and they all laughed but it's true you know it's it's I don't use it for fighting, but I use it all the time. And especially when I was a nurse, I use those skills all the time, especially Tai Chi. You know, it's all about, you know, you touch the other person. It means you can feel what they're doing and you can feel how to control them. And that's very useful when you're working with, you know, elderly, sick people who are at risk of falling. I I could be walking with them and I could feel they were going to fall and I would like maneuver them back into a stable position. So you can get them off balance, but you can also get them back into balance with Tai Chi. So that's that's one of my stories there. I feel like, you know, I was able to draw in the skills when I needed it in an emergency and they worked just fine. I love that story because it's, yeah. it is a martial arts story through and through, and yet there's no combat in it whatsoever. Right, right. And I think exactly. all too often when we look at what we develop as martial artists, we look at the physical stuff, you know, I'm, I'm stronger, I'm healthier. We look at the mental stuff like discipline and, and depth of character, and we look at our combat skill. But we don't necessarily look at where those other things intersect in everyday life. And that right. story illustrates yeah. that. Right, right. We're far more likely to have benefit from martial arts day to day in a non confrontational situation than we are in a confrontational situation. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's what you use all day long. I, you know, I, I, I m- my, my nursing background is actually gerontology nursing. I have a master's in gerontology nursing and, and I teach a lot of Tai Chi classes for seniors and I have students that are in their nineties and, and one woman who is uh, I think around 90, 91, Uh, has been working with me for almost 25 years. And she was saying she had to change the light bulb in her kitchen. And so she climbed up on a chair and reached up and unscrewed the light bulb and put a new one in. And all of her friends are standing around looking horrified, like you changed the light bulb in your kitchen because they're all in their 80s and 90s too. She said she got down off the chair and she said, thank you, Jeannie. That was all Tai Chi. But yeah, exactly. Everything that she does, around her house, everything that, that they, you know, they, they keep telling me they draw in the Tai Chi when they, you know, they're walking, uh, when they start to lose their balance. It's, that, it's especially good for, for older people because all the skills that you develop from practicing Tai Chi are the ones that you need as you start to age mm-hmm. um, in order to stay independent and stay active. And again, I keep telling them, you know, I can teach you, uh, we do pushing hands sometimes, my seniors call it fighting. <laughs> and, then, you know, they can do it. They, it, it they, they can feel like they're, you know, they're actually practicing a martial art, but it, it's, it's all soft and it's all controlled. So, uh, and I say, you know, you, you can, you can use the stuff for fighting, but most of the time we're going to just use it to, you know, stay healthy and stay active. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, you're not, it's you're, just a wonderful art, yeah. You're not going to fight every day, but you will hopefully live every day, at least every day you're alive, you're right. living, so you might as well make that stuff better. Right, right. Other than yeah. than Tai Chi and, and, and Chinese arts, I mean, let's kind of lump it in there because you mentioned some of the other disciplines that you've practiced. What else do you do? Do you have other hobbies or things that you're passionate about? Um, you know, it's all kind of martial arts related to a great extent. I, I love Kung Fu movies and that actually came from, um, from working in the Chinatown movie theaters. And that job also arose from being a student at, at Sifu Mark school. Um, one of the local movie projectionists was taking classes and when, she told me that she worked in the Chinatown theaters. I was like, that must be the best job in the world. And how do you get a job like that? And she said, well, one of our people was leaving in a couple of months so I can train you um, to, to do it. So that's 
starting in um, 1979 uh, until 1986, I, I worked in Chinatown movie theaters, the star in the cinema in Boston, and just fell in love with you know, not just Kung Fu movies, but Chinese cinema in general. And so that's, um, that's, that's one of my passions. And, and I started researching a lot of the history of, of Kung Fu movies and tracing them back to the 1920s, uh, which is really um, just a fascinating subject for me. And also the history of, of Chinese martial arts in general. I guess I'm a little bit of a history geek and, you know, just learning these stories about um, the people that, that um, sort of contributed so much to what the art is today. Uh, for me, that just kind of enriches my experience of it. Uh, you, I, I can actually what I, I was going to ask you to elaborate that on that a little bit. The idea okay. that these movies. Well, I help. was going to say I, I have this theory. I told Donnie my theory. He looked a little bemused by it, but but I think there's lineages in in kung fu filmmaking, just as there are in the martial arts schools, and I think the lineage that I consider Donnie part of goes back through uh, his mentor Yun Wu Ping and Yun Wu Ping's father Yun Su Tin who worked since 1930 with a director named Ren Pengnian, who um, probably directed the first Kung Fu movie. It was a short film around 1919. Um, so they've been, since that, since 1919, since 1930, they've been trying to figure out how to show these arts most effectively on screen. And, you know, all the research that they do. I know from when I did, um, when I, I used to do interviews with Donnie for, for uh, Kung Fu Cinema, I probably did about eight or nine of them uh, over the years, each time he had a new movie coming out. And he would talk a lot about how hard it would be sometimes to work with people who had no previous experience making martial arts films. Even a director who's a very good director they they don't understand where the camera has to go to show the technique to the best advantage. They don't know how to change the angle of a technique from what it would be in a real fight to what it has to be in order to register on camera as a powerful technique. They don't understand how to how to choreograph a fight scene so that you know the the timing and the angles and everything comes together with you know the, just the best possible result. And this is something that comes through, um, you know, like learning from a mentor and then researching yourself. It's the same as learning a martial art. You have a Sifu and then you have to research the movement and make it your own. That's That goes on in, in martial arts filmmaking, at least the Hong Kong variety, um, just the way it does in the martial arts schools. And so uh, Donnie is kind of, I think, building on these generations of, of previous filmmakers and, you know, he takes their skills and then advances them even further. And, you know, I, maybe it's just me, but that, that sort of image makes a lot of sense to me that, that he's part of this Kung Fu movie lineage the same way he's part of the traditional martial arts lineage through his mother. Makes sense to me. Yeah. And I think yeah. I cut you off. You were... You were... No. I had to, to speak about something else when I asked you to elaborate there. We were talking about the things that you're passionate actually, about. I think that, that's what, no, I think that's what I was, oh, what? Sorry. No, no, but this, this is your episode. We can go wherever, okay. wherever you want. <laughs> okay. But we had been talking <laughs> okay. about hobbies and pursuits and you talked about. Right. The and theater. I don't have any life outside of Kung Fu. Okay. Unfortunately. Not too much anyway. But, you know, one thing I, I would like to talk about a little bit is, um, is uh, Sifu's art, Bosun Mark's art and um it's very wide ranging and i was thinking back to those early days uh as a student of hers and back then she had um a, a double curriculum that that she actually had posted up on the wall and i dug out this little booklet that that she used to um sell for a dollar to her new students that had her history in it and and explained the curriculum and and uh, you may be aware that she was, I think, the first person here in the United States who was teaching the standardized competition forms that had become popular in China, I think, like starting in the 1960s. 
Um, and these were the ones that, for instance, Jet Li became famous as, as a champion of, you know, competition, uh, wushu. And, um, it, it, they were very acrobatic. They were very, um, um, athletic and nobody else at the time, you know, most people were still doing in this country. I think it was mostly Southern boxing, which is very grounded. So, so she was teaching stuff that had like aerial car, cartwheels where you'd land in a split, you know, and doing multiple butterfly kicks in a circle and a lot of really elaborate, um, you know, acrobatic techniques. Uh, and there were a lot of people that came to her just to learn that kind of stuff. But she also had her second curriculum was the traditional martial arts. And that came from her main teacher, her Sifu, um, Fu Wing Fei, Grandmaster Fu Wing Fei. And so it was the Fu style or the Fu family arts that she, she offered as, as her traditional curriculum. And um, that was the side of her art that appealed to me the most. And Fu style comes from uh, Grandmaster Fu, Fu Wing Fei's father is Fu Chen Song. And he was the founder of the art. And um, he was a master of, of Tai Chi, Pakwa, Sing Yi, and Wudong Sword. And so his son, Fu Wing Fei, uh, you know, also those were the those were the main um, skills that he taught. But but the 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 father Fu Chen Sung he he worked with a lot of very famous martial artists in China in the 1920s and 30s in the sense that they were colleagues. They were army trainers in the same army. Um, they shared a lot of techniques. So a lot of the like the Fu Stao Sing Yi comes from Sun Lu Tang. I don't I, I don't know if you're familiar with um, some of these. Um, old masters, but Sun Lutang in the 1930s wrote a series of, of books about Tai Chi, Pakwa, and Sun Yi, and is, is very well known as one of the first real um, popularizers of, of these arts. And the, the whole Fu style system is a very, um, I want to say, dramatic looking type of movement. It's, it's, um, it, 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 there's a lot of waste twisting, a lot of spiraling of the movement. The, both the Pakwa and the, the Wudong styles are very, um, you know, the, 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 the way you twist your body into these um, sort of very graceful arcs and spirals. Uh, it, it, visually, it's very appealing. And, and I really think, again, when I look at Donnie's art on screen, even if he's not, you know, even if he's doing Wing Chun or something that has nothing to do with Fu style, there's always that little bit of a torque to his waist. There's always, I mean, nothing is just simply straight up and down. You're always kind of working slight angles and, and feeling the energy going in, in multiple directions. And, and I think that's uh, one of the reasons why she, uh, Sifu Mark, uh, had such an impact when she first came over here. It wasn't just that she was the only one teaching these competition styles, but even when she did her traditional arts, even her Tai Chi, um, it was just really um, dynamic looking and, and you could see the power moving through it in a way that, you know, some of the, the, the styles that had been popular up to that time, they don't, they don't have quite that, that drama to them. So I, you know, I think that was one reason why I fell in love with it as soon as I saw it. I remember watching watching her and her students perform a month or two after I started studying at the school. They were performing one of her forms called Liang Yi, which combines Tai Chi and Pakwa, and and it's a beautiful form and it's really fun to do. But it's it's 81 movements and it takes. I keep saying it took me 20 years to learn how to do it, but it it. it I just was watching them with my mouth hanging open. It's just so gorgeous. And, and I think, you know, one of the reasons that, that people got so excited about studying with her is just that she could do this beautiful art at such a high level that, you know, it was like, yeah, it, it was like watching uh, almost like watching something, supernatural you know like she doesn't have real hips like the rest of us she has like ball bearings or something and, and nobody can actually move that smoothly that gliding that 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 power it's it just um you, you just 
left her performances and left her classes feeling so inspired, you know, that if I can get even a little piece of that, I'll be really happy. Yeah. Certainly in watching the little bit of her that I've seen, it's, it's either supernatural or superhuman, depending on how you're looking at it. Right. Yeah. And yeah. It's clear that there are some people who were born to do martial arts, but born to do martial arts in a certain way. And they were fortunate enough to find, and I guess to a certain degree, forge that way for themselves and exemplify it. And, and that's what we see whenever we see any footage of, of her. And it's great to hear you describing it in that way as someone who was so up close and, and personal with that training. Right. Yeah. And actually I've been, I've been doing some research because I'm, I'm trying to put together an updated lineage um, chart for, for our school website. And so whenever I have the chance, I'm trying to do some research. Um, and, and she learned all those competition wushu forms uh, as well as, as the combined Tai Chi form, which eventually became her signature Tai Chi form. Combined Tai Chi is not a Fu style form, but she ended up kind of adopting that as her own Tai Chi form and putting a lot of Fu style flavor into it. But the combined Tai Chi was one of the standardized competition forms and it was created around 1960 and combined movements from the five major Tai Chi forms that, um, that were popular at that time. And all that stuff she learned from a wushu coach in the early sixties uh, in, in Guangzhou. And his name, his name is Deng, Deng Gamdo. I'm probably not pronouncing these Chinese names completely correctly, but I, you know, we've only just recently, I'm actually going to, I'm, I'm actually going to talk to her tomorrow because I'm working on an article about um, the origins of, of combined Tai Chi. And I, uh, uh, we started talking about this coach recently, and he's a very well-regarded um, teacher. He's, he has he's passed away now, but there's students of his teaching all over the world. And he was actually her first real teacher. And I think going through that wushu training with all the acrobatic stuff, you know, with you know the, everybody learning to do the kicks and this level of precision, um, you know learning to do all the, the flips and the jumps and everything. And then going to the Fu style. So she did that for about five years. And I think she continued training with him even after she um, started practicing with Grandmaster Fu. But I think it's the combination of the Wushu and the traditional Fu style that, that really um, sort of made her, her art pretty unique um, because these are, they're, they're not the same, but they're both very, very precise, very demanding, and they both require a lot of control. What she called her waist, you know, basically using your center to make the movement happen. And for anyone that has seen video of the stuff that we're talking about, that certainly makes sense to you. And for those of you that haven't, we'll try to get some video up on the show notes that might help illustrate some of these concepts. Because if you haven't spent time in Chinese arts, and maybe you're a, more of a Japanese or a Korean art practitioner, some of these concepts that we're talking about might seem really foreign to you. So I'll, I'll try to find some stuff that we can use to illustrate it. The show notes, if you're new to the show, that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We've heard a lot of happy things today, certainly. Okay. <laughs> you know, you, you've talked about a lot of positive stuff, things that have really resonated for you through your life. But I know that life is always, for all of us, there, there's stuff that's not on that end of the spectrum. And I'm hoping you might tell us about a time in your life where things weren't so good and how you were able to lean on your martial arts to get through it. Um, yeah, actually, you know, I guess maybe I've been, I've been pretty lucky. I, I, I haven't had any really, um, you know, uh, obviously everybody has some losses and, and, you know, things go up and things go down, but, but, you know, as long as I can maintain my practice, that, that really does help keep me feeling like I'm on an even keel. But the, the one time where I, I feel like uh, I had to make a decision about what direction I was going to go in was after I went into nursing and, and I, I finished nursing school. It was a, a master's program that was at the Mass General Hospital. It was, it was pretty demanding. Um, and I, I finished that around 1990. And I 
was intending to make a career as a nurse, and, and especially with the master's degree. I, I spent a few years doing staff nursing to get that experience. And then it would be expected that I would either become a nurse practitioner or, or move into administrative work. And, and I was working at, at the, actually the Chinatown nursing home. I never get very far away from <laughs> what's close to my heart. I was, so I was working at the Chinatown nursing home, learning Chinese by talking to the residents there and, you know, watching the Chinese TV with them. And, um, and, I was kind of expected to move up the ladder. They gave me some administrative jobs. And I think eventually if I'd wanted to, I could have become the director of nursing. But after I'd been in nursing for about five or six years, I felt like, you know, I wasn't practicing. I wasn't practicing my Tai Chi. I wasn't practicing my art. I wasn't advancing. I wasn't learning new stuff. I was too busy working and then too exhausted after work. So I really had to make up my mind. Was I going to pursue a career in nursing or was I going to just devote myself to, to my practice? And, and basically I ended up cutting my hours back to part-time and taking the financial loss um, with the idea that once I retired, um, I would, I would supplement my retirement income by teaching Tai Chi so that was kind of, you know, again, I I had to decide what shape my life was going to take, and do I want to pursue money or do I want to do I want to pursue this art? And it wasn't actually too hard to make the decision. It was harder to justify it to like my family and other people, but for me, the the, the right choice seemed very clear. I, I've always kind of prioritized the my art over everything else in my life. So I think you kind of, it, it, for some people, you get so obsessive about it. And, and some of my good buddies are just like me. It's like, you know, this is all that really counts. <laughs> Everything else is secondary. And, and I think Sifu was like that to a certain extent, too. And, and I know she talked about sometimes she felt guilty that she wasn't always there for her family because she was really, you know, driven to, to you know, to accomplish not just, you know, not just the physical stuff she was working on herself, but also to present it to the larger world. That that kind of was always her dream to to you know, to to show wushu to the American public. And I think you know she definitely succeeded in that. She definitely caught people's attention. But you know, I, I I'd also say that you know to a certain extent it was just she and, and Mr. Yen for their family, it was like kind of the typical immigrant experience. Um, they were both really busy with work. And I think, um, both Donnie and Chris, um, maybe didn't see their parents as much as they would have liked because there was just always so much work to do. And, and Sifu was at the school from morning through night, seven days a week. And, you know, just, there wasn't much, family life. I, I actually, I, I was talking to Donnie a, a couple of years ago when he was in, in Boston and I had seen an interview with him um, where he, he said that he doesn't have too many memories of family dinners from when he was a kid. He said something about, it seemed like there were always students around. And I, I know in the early years um, that they actually rented out space in their house to some of Sifu's students. And again, that's a very immigrant thing to do. You just try to you know, get as much money from as many different sources as you can, because usually people come here with nothing. And I said, you know, I remember after class, sometimes Sifu would say, who wants to go out to dinner? And we'd all be, oh, that's great. We're going to have dinner with Sifu and Mr. Yen and Donnie and Chris. Yeah, and it's like, I didn't think that, you know, it meant that Donnie and Chris wouldn't have any private family time, you know, there wasn't a family dinner. It was like, you know, instead it's a dozen people sitting around a big table in Chinatown, everybody talking at once. And I think they, they lost out a little bit on that kind of family experience because, um, you know, the, the school was really, you know, the Sifu's baby as much as her kids were. And she was really devoted to, you know, making it thrive. For the people out there, but, that, you know, anyway. go ahead. I was going to say they, they both turned out just fine. And I think they understand now, but it, it was tough. It was tough when they were young. 
we have a lot of people that, that listen that are not martial arts instructors. You know, certainly a good chunk are, but for those folks out there that are students and have always been martial arts students, you know, you, you just told a story about someone seemingly prioritizing their, their teaching over some other aspects of life that others would not make that sacrifice for. You're right. an instructor and you've given up a lot of your life and you, you told us a story about how you considered giving up even more of your life to focus on your teaching. Are you able to articulate what that mindset is like for people that haven't been there? Well, it, it's not just teaching, but my practice in general, but definitely teaching. For me, teaching is, is part of my own practice. Um, uh, you, you, you learn a lot from having to break the material down, and you learn a lot from having to answer your students' questions, because they're always going to come up with questions that you've never even thought about. And then you're going to have to research or look at something from a slightly different point of view before you can answer. So as far as I'm concerned, teaching is a really important part of your own practice. But um, practicing for me just means that, you know, every day you try to do something. Um, it, it, it means that you're always trying to research. You, I, I always say, whenever you think or say, I got this, that's when your practice dies. You've always got to be super critical and say, no, it can be better. Yeah, And that's something I learned from Sifu. She never, never said, okay, this is fine. You know, let's move on. It was always, you can, you can make it better. You can go deeper. You can refine it a little bit more. You can make the technique more difficult. Um, and she, um, it, it, it was just really important to her to, for us to realize that all she could give us was like a set of tools. She couldn't teach us exactly how to do the movement. That had to come from us. You just have to repeat it over and over again mindfully and and you know, trying to she she gave us what she called the characteristics and requirements. Six characteristics, six requirements. We always had to measure what we were doing against that. And and so you have an ideal but you're always a work in progress trying to reach that ideal. Uh, and I think for, for a student, even a casual student, uh, I think it's important to realize that memorizing the steps is, is only the beginning. And it's not even the most important part. Um, you, you know, you, you, if a student is having trouble remembering the Tai Chi movements, I'll tell them just do Tai Chi beginning, but try to do it mindfully, you know, that's just arms up, arms down, but really feel what's going on in your body. If you can do that, you're a lot better off than somebody that knows 20 movements, but just sort of blows through them without really feeling too much of what's going on. So that that's something I got from my teacher that I found ha, has been extremely valuable in my practice is just that, you know, keep doing it, not always the same, keep changing it, and then figuring out why one way works better than another. Um, it, it, again, research. She called, she originally called her school the Chinese Wushu Research Institute because she wanted to emphasize that, that you know, you have to do a lot of the work yourself. Now the school's name is the Bosun Mark Tai Chi Arts Association, but a lot of people still use that old CWRI name because um, that's that's how she first became known. But um, it, she she deliberately wanted to put that in the name of the school because it was so important. Mm. And it's all research. I mean, once you reach a certain level, everything, everything is research. You know, nursing became research for me, you know, like they were walking my patients, you know, like um, trying to do a dressing change on somebody who's a little demented and is trying to fight you. So you're, you use your pushing hands technique to redirect, <laughs> <laughs> redirect them away from hitting you while you're trying to change their bandage. You know, yeah. it's like, it, it, like you were saying before, it, 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 it just, it's, it, it, it becomes part of your everyday life. It's not something separate. It's it, just always there. And certainly in nursing school, they're not going to teach you how to use pushing hands to, to subdue, to gently subdue the patient and change that dressing. And they're not going right. to teach you how to right. well, change yeah, a bandage right, right. In, tai, in, in Tai Chi or in, in Wushu. So yeah. but you I had do to have do to the say research. A lot of what I, 
Yeah, well, a lot of what I learned in nursing just confirmed that, you know, Tai Chi is really good for your health. There's, there's like actual physiological um, reasons why the stuff that we do is good for you and also keeps you active um, later in life. And, and um, you know, uh, one of our other students, Rick Wong, is a physical therapist. And so I, I talked to him about using Tai Chi as part of your as part of your job. And he uses a lot of the, the, the concepts of Tai Chi in his, in his therapy work. So it's just, it's super adaptable. <laughs> yeah, I find myself wondering, why doesn't everybody do this? You know, everybody could benefit from it. But yeah, I guess some people love it and some people just don't see the point. But um, I, it, it, the, the great thing is it's, it's an exercise and it's a sport. And it's it's a combat system that you're never going to get too old for. You can keep doing it for the rest of your life. So, you know, whatever skills I can build at any point in my life, I'm just going to keep advancing and advancing and advancing. So, I, to me, that's just, that's a big motivating factor. We heard about your first instructor in Pennsylvania. We've heard your love and reverence for Sifu Mark. But other than those two, is there someone that you can look at and say, this person was really influential on my path? Um, yeah, I've actually, I've actually been working with two people. So Sifu pretty much retired about six or seven years ago. And, and she and Mr. Yen spend a lot of time in China now. So, um, and, and I'm teaching a lot of classes. I teach at her school in Chinatown, but I, I still want to go on learning. So the, the two people that have been really valuable uh, for me in the last few years are, are Sifu's younger sister, Sue Yinmark. Um, actually, Sifu's sister and her brother um, also studied for many years with, with Grandmaster Fu Wing Fei in, in Guangzhou, but, but they didn't open schools and they didn't really do public performances or anything, but they kept their practice going. And Su Yin is more interested in the Qigong side of the art, uh, as opposed to forms or, or, you know, martial applications, but she goes deep, deep, deep into, um, the connections between various parts of your body and what you're supposed to be feeling as, as you do these movements. And she, she, she doesn't live in Boston, but she comes here about, um, at least three or four times a year and does seminars. And I found I found her instruction to be very useful, and and to a great extent, it's because it's very complementary to what I've learned from her sister. You know, basically, when Su Yin breaks down these movements and says, you know, this is how you make the waist move this way, and then the arm moves that way, and it's like, okay, I've seen Sifu do that, and I wasn't sure exactly how she was doing it, and now. Now I'm starting to realize, you know, it's because I wasn't ready to, to go that deep before, but now I can. And, and so the, the Qi Kung stuff I get from Su Yen. And then um, one, of, one of Sifu's first Boston students is a guy who um, teaches here in, in the Boston area. He teaches advanced internal classes and by invitation only. And um, I started going to his classes about four years ago. And, and he really pushes me to be more combat oriented. We, we work sometimes with, um, with pads, you know, trying to get power into the strikes and, and we do a lot of two person exercises. He has me doing, doing her sing Yi and, and, and he taught me uh, the Fu style tiger boxing form, which is not stuff I did when I was younger. It, it seemed too intimidating, but, but now I find I enjoy it. The, the stuff comes a little, easier to me now but it's definitely a more kung fu like you know more, more fighting looking anyway but you know it's it's good for me i i've always like i said i've always been more on the you know soft you know peaceful side but you know this guy helps me to get get the power out and think about you know controlling the other person being more martial so i have chi kung and i have i have combat tai chi going for me right now and so I'm happy, you know, it's like, and we're all part of the same family. I, again, the, the great thing about Sifu's art and Sifu's school is that, you know, it's not just her. She's always been part of this huge network. And, um, you know, even 
you know, years ago, there would always be visiting martial arts artists coming. Uh, old friends of hers would come from Hong Kong and teach seminars. And, and you know, it, it was just all about, you know, like learning as much variety as you can. So um, in that sense, you know, there's a lot of different people that have influenced me. But I think um, the, the ones that I would consider the, 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 the most influential after Bosa and Mark would be her sister Su Yin, and then um, and then my friend, <laughs> my my kung fu brother, my 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 Si Hang. So, if you could train with someone you haven't, who would that be? Uh, is it just people alive now, or can it be anybody, anybody? anywhere in time? We'll, we'll okay. make it as well, open again, as possible. Well. I would just have to stay in my own family. I, I would want to go back to um, the originator of the Fu style, Fu Chen Song. I, I, I study photos of him and try to imagine what it must have looked like when he was actually moving. He was bad eyes. He was, he was, I mean, he killed people with those strikes. He was a, he, you know, he was in, he was an army trainer. He, he was one of those professional bodyguards back in the day. He, he fought bandits. He, he, he was, he was, you know, a real Kung Fu fighter and stories about him are like right out of the Kung Fu movies, except they're true. And, um, I, I will have to say though, if I'm fantasizing about going back in time and studying with him, I would specify, I would want to do his public classes in Guangzhou. I think he taught in the YMCA, um, back in the twenties and thirties. Because I heard he was really hard on his private students and would hit them all the time. I have a feeling the public classes were probably more just here's the forms, just fall off. So, <laughs> so if I could go anywhere and any time to study with anybody, it would be it would be his uh, his public classes back in the 1920s and 30s. So. I, I like I like that qualification on the answer. <laughs> That's, right. We, yeah. we don't usually get qualifications. I, I, you know, we get we get this person, but we don't usually get when in time, where in time, or, yeah, or in the right. in, yeah. in what context. Yeah. Well, but that's I, that's the history geek in me. Yeah, out. <laughs> yeah. Well, that I mean, that's completely appropriate because when we yeah. think about most of the the good martial arts instructors that we know, and I'm, I'm thinking of the ones that I know, they do teach differently to different people. Just as mm -hmm. you mentioned very early in the episode. Sifu Mark had this way of knowing what would bring you forward in the best right. way that wasn't always what you wanted to learn. You know, I, I think most great instructors are like that, that, you know, they, they know the best path to get you where you're going, where you want to go or where you deserve to go in the time that you have left. Because let's be honest, we could study any martial art for multiple lifetimes and still not get all right. the way to the end. There's no end. I, I think we all know right. that. Right. Yeah. 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 Couple. Yeah. You know, we have a lot of sayings from, from Cecil Mark that, that we tend to quote at each other. And, and one, I think that comes up more than anything else is that um, Tai Chi or, or Wushu or Chinese internal arts, uh, whichever term you want to use um, is rich in content, <laughs> which just means yeah, there's just so much there. <laughs> so many variables, so many variations, so many options, so much to learn, so much to master, so much to enjoy. Um, it's rich in content. <laughs> Undoubtedly. Let's talk about competition for a second. That's not something that we tend to hear about as much from the guests that we've had on the show that are of a Chinese background. But was that ever part of your path? Um, not really. There's only one time I actually competed and that was <laughs> in China, <laughs> if you can imagine. If you're going to uh, do 19... it, do it right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, in 1984, um, Sifu got an invitation for, um, what was being billed as the first, um, Tai Chi, um, competition and friendship meeting, something like that. Tai Chi, Tai Chi Chuan and Jian. So fist and sword um, competition and friendship meeting. And it was uh, being held in, in Wuhan in China. And uh, I don't know if they ever had any other ones, but this was a pretty big deal. They had about a dozen of uh, the top Tai Chi masters from, from all around China 
there. And Chen Shaowang, I think, he, I think he's the only one that's still alive because mostly they were elderly. But then if you're familiar with Chen Shaowang, he's like the 14th generation Chen family uh, practitioner. He, he travels around a lot and teaches teaches classes. But he was representing Chen's Dao Tai Chi. They're, they're, um, the daughter of Sun Lutong is there representing Sun Lutong's Dao um, the, the the founder of Wu Dao, uh, Wu Jiancheng. I'm kind of mangling these names, but his his daughter was there, Wu Yinghua, and her husband Ma Yueliang. Ma Yueliang is, I mean, he's a legendary um, pushing hands expert, and he he did a demonstration on that. There's a guy named Xiao Guo Zheng, um, one of the Yang family guys was there, and Li Tianji, who became Sifu's. Um, second major teacher. I mean, there was the Wushu coach, I guess was the first and then Fu Wing Fei and then Li Tianji, I guess would be her third teacher, but um, he's the one that created the combined Tai Chi and she ended up, um, and that's a whole other story too. She ended up studying with him for a while in the early eighties, but he was there. And so it was just, she took, she took a, a group of about, I think 13 or 14 of us over and she wanted all of us to compete. Some of the guys didn't, you know, some people decided they didn't want to, but, um, but it was a friendly group, you know, basically they gave everybody a score and then all the people that got the top third of the scores got a gold medal. All the people that got the middle third in the scores got a silver medal. And then the lower third of the scores got a gold medal. So everybody got a, a medal, but you sort of knew where you were in the ranking. <laughs> So I, I got a silver medal. I was I, my score was right about dead middle between the highest and the lowest. And I have to tell you the the high score was a young woman who was um, the uh, Chinese national champion in Tai Chi um, from from Beijing. And the second highest score, something like point zero two or point two points behind the high score, was was my Sifu. And I also have to say people that were there told me beforehand that the the national champion in Tai Chi was going to get the high score. That was kind of given. So <laughs> I think they were doing a little bit of like weighing like, okay, you know, both and Mark and this other woman. Okay. We got, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So anyhow, um, see if we got the second highest score, but, uh, but you know, when she was performing, the audience was applauding. And there was a woman from Canada who was uh, next to me who was watching and and she had been studying martial arts in China for a couple of years. And she said, I've never seen anybody applaud Tai Chi like this. People just don't don't applaud for Tai Chi. It's considered boring. So, you know, she really impressed the audience. And uh, um, that so that was a that was a really interesting experience. But that's the only time I ever got an award or, or or even competed. And like I said, it was friendly in the sense that, you know, nobody was going to be treated too badly. Even the low scores didn't go that low. But it was also intimidating because all these masters were sitting there watching you. Some of them were the judges. And so I felt like, well, if I get through this, all right, I'll never be this nervous about getting up and doing my Tai Chi in front of an audience again. And that definitely worked. Whenever I'd get stage fright after that, I just remember what it was like being in China. <laughs> and I said, this isn't as bad, so I can get through this. <laughs> but it, it, it was great. And, and Grandmaster Fu was there too. That was that was when I had the chance to meet him. And he was just a, a wonderful, very, very sweet-natured, very, very... Um, um, kind person, I think. Mm -hmm. But the first thing he asked us, he wanted to know how how many hours each of us practiced every day. <laughs> how many hours? Not how many hours a week. Listeners. Right? How many? How many hours how a many day? Hours every day do we practice? And everybody kind of looked at each other and one guy said, well, you know, we all have jobs. And then the second thing Grandmaster Fu said to us was, do you know how much time your teacher spent studying with me when she was my student? And we said, yeah, it was something like 10 hours a day, right? And he said, all day, every day. <laughs> yeah. That's certainly so then one we way to get really, really good at something. But yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. But I think, you know, I think that's what they did. I mean, that was, that was back in the sixties and they, she just, she, she said sometimes they'd start at like four o'clock in the morning mm-hmm. and just train. So it's a different world. different. Yeah. And I think that, I don't know if people are going to be able to advance to the level of these old time practitioners because we have so many distractions in our life now the the world has changed so much even in china i don't know if people can can train with that level of dedication for that long it, i don't i don't think so i don't think so but yeah. one of the things that i always see and and listeners know you may not know prior to whistle kick i had an it company and a lot of the marketing that we did involved me writing and i was did a lot of writing and worked on some online publications. And one of the things that I found, and it's easier to to see in hindsight is a new technology comes in and it kind of consumes everything. And then it backs out to some degree and finds its place, you know, kind of like the, the, the ripples from a wave. Right. Yeah. And so I'm expecting that we're in this, this peak of technology involvement right now and then it will back out in some way. I mean, we've, we're already starting to see, you know, the, the very younger generation resistant to it in some ways. And what I'm hoping hmm. is that we have enough technology to document the older, the great masters that it's going to skip my generation, but then the next one will be able to look back and they will allow themselves more time. They will, train harder they'll be more passionate because technology will just kind of be there rather than being something to right right. maybe be yeah yeah maybe be more in their body instead of all on the screens focused on the screens all the time i think that would be a a big thing but yeah you know the other thing is like i said i i i study these photos that we have of great grandmaster fu chen song trying to imagine how he looked when he moved but the you know, after after mid century, you know, mid twentieth century, the, the good martial arts practitioners have all been recorded on film or video. So you know, you're not going to have to, you know, look at still pictures and try to imagine what the movement looked like. There's going to be all these recordings of you know the highest level people you know doing their art. And like I said, sometimes I think it can take sometimes decades to be able to figure out how to do some of the really deep adjustments that that make the movement happen on the outside but and i don't know how much of that deep stuff you can reconstruct just from seeing uh, a visual record of it but certainly people students in the future are going to have a lot more resources and they're going to be able to study these old videos and and you know again it's all research. So you get some ideas from watching somebody and you try to incorporate that into your practice and then your practice gets a little richer. So I, I I think it's, it's great in a way that we have, we have all these recordings and, and my dream actually in the future is that they'll start doing the, um, um, motion capture on the best people, you know, where the, you wear the sensors and Mm. go through your forms and then they'll be able to, look at it you know ideally i guess i am assuming you you'd be able to rotate the image and see it from from different uh angles and then you really be able to to get a good sense of what that person is doing there was a project i bumped into in some news article and if i remember correctly it was from china that was doing just that how big oh, okay, it was yeah. and how much money was behind it i don't know because that's not a, a inexpensive thing to do but right, they had that yeah. same goal that same idea that that you did and as yeah. that becomes less expensive i think we'll, right. we'll see more yeah. of that yeah yeah i think so too because that can lead to to holograms and that can lead to analysis i mean i think i think we've all always dreamed of the ability to study remotely and right, we've never yeah. really been able to do that, but there's an opportunity that technology might actually make that possible to do it in a closer to to what I think most of us would call the right way. Right, yeah. You know, yeah. To, to have that feedback to, I mean, heck, if we combine that with holograms, you know, you can have people training right alongside you and you can see them and, and how neat would that be? Right, right. But I... 
you know, I've talked to my friends about this and what I think would be a, a very necessary component of that is some way for you to get feedback though, whether it's by, you know, some way that, that the system could analyze your movement and say your hip always goes up when you do this, this part of the movement uh, right. or, you know, that sort of thing, or you're straightening your knee too much at this point or, you know, this, cause that's the sort of thing that, you know, you don't always pick up on. And you need somebody with a skilled eye to look at you and say, okay, if you just made these tiny adjustments, everything would flow a lot better. But, you know, I'm sure they can get, eventually they'll have, I don't know, AI or expert programs or something that'll that'll give you that feedback. They'll analyze the video of you and say, you're doing this wrong and you're doing that wrong. And okay, yeah, this time it was better. And then you, yeah, then the, then the, the, the system will be, the program will be your teacher. I, th- I but think, I think without of, the feedback. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I, I think that there's, I think all the technology we need to make that work exists, but we're just, we're not there because it's expensive. Yeah, and, right. And, yeah. Uh, but as, it'll come. It'll yeah. come. Well, we're, we're also kind of resistant to change as martial artists, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for good and for bad. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly two yeah. sides to that coin. Well, yeah. Yin and yang, right. Yeah, yes, exactly. Without a doubt. <laughs> Let's talk about movies. Now, this might be a, uh, a, a, a different sort of line of questioning for you versus a lot of our other guests, because I, I'm going to guess, I'm just going to, if I was a betting person, I would put a good chunk down that you've seen more martial arts films than our other guests because of the job you had. And, right. And, yeah. And, I've seen a lot of weird ones too, obscure right. ones. I shouldn't say weird. And you've probably seen yeah. a lot of them more than once. Yeah. Do you yeah. have a favorite? Can you pin it down that way? It's hard to pick out to pick out just one. I, I it, you know, there there are a couple of classic movies that I think I could watch over and over again. And and one would have to be Once Upon a Time in China, two, the second one, uh, which Donnie is in, and like that whole like I'd say the half last half hour or so of the movie. Is just you know one great action set piece after another, and I, I just consider that to be some of the best um, choreography and and the best executed choreography that that has been recorded on film. And and then another one that I I put right up there is um, Iron Monkey. Oh, and again, that's a, a Donnie movie. And then some of the, the, the early classic Jackie Chan movies, like, like Drunken Master, the, the first one, I think is just, um, there's just so much in that. And it's so funny. You know, you can watch it over and over again and it, it never gets old. And some of the other ones that he made around the same time, there's one called The Young Master that I really like. Um, but I used to think, I wish there was some way that, you know, when I pass on, if my consciousness could be projected into those movies, I would be perfectly happy. <laughs> that would be like my ideal of paradise would be just like, you know, following Jackie Chan and Donnie around the streets of these you know, old fashioned towns while they get into trouble and get into fights. <laughs> How about but, an act? Um, yeah. and, and, those, and those are great films. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm wondering, yeah. I'm wondering about actors. I mean, obviously you have, a special place in your heart for Donnie in a way that right, I'm going to yeah. say nobody else listening does, <laughs> which is great. So I, I'm, I'm not we going like family. Yeah. Yeah. Like family. yeah. And, and, and obviously we, we think differently about those people that we're close to. And when we see them achieve things and do something like he's done, and, and I'm, I'm the first one to say he is the greatest that is currently acting. I mean, there's nobody that, that holds a candle to what he's doing currently on film for me, but right. if you had to yeah. look back yeah. over time, is he your favorite, or does, or does somebody else maybe occupy that spot? Um, I well, yeah, I think uh, the the people that are active now, he's the one that I'm I'm most excited about, most interested in seeing what he's going to do next. Um, and I I do want to say too that you know I, I I've known Donnie since he was in high school, and his his movement has always been really outstanding. What what super impressed me, and I, I really, you know, maybe couldn't have predicted, is um, that he became such a good um, action director, choreographer, and action director. And I remember watching um, 
one of the first movies he directed, um, Ballistic Kiss, and about 15 minutes into it thinking, you know, this this movie is really well made considering it was on a shoestring budget. Visually, it's really arresting and, and you know, it, 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 it draws you in. The action scenes are extremely well done. And I, I thought, you know, I, I've always thought of Donnie as like a good martial artist. And now I'm starting to think of him as a really good director too. So that was a skill that I kind of didn't see coming that, you know, again, I think from the, the, you know, studying with his mentor and, and working in the, the Hong Kong film industry um, all through the eighties and the, and the nineties, um, you know, it, it, they work so fast that if something doesn't work, you just try it again in the next movie until you finally get it right. And I think that's how he reached a point where, you know, now he knows, he knows what to do. He knows what's going to look good and what, what, you know, you you should avoid because it's just not going to work. And, and I really have a lot of respect for him for staying with it this long. And, and, you know, again, you, you have to be obsessed to a certain degree to advance in, in the art of filmmaking, as well as in the art of martial arts. And he's been willing to put that time and effort in to, to reach that, that pinnacle. But in terms of, of other favorite actors, I, I like everybody else <laughs> who is a fan of like the golden age of, of, you know, Kung Fu cinema. I, I, I tend to go back a little bit further. And um, of course there's people like Bruce Lee and, and Gordon Liu and, and the, the actresses back then, um, Angela Mao and and um, there was a woman named Shu Fong. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she did a lot of movies with King Hu, uh, the director King Hu. And and there was a woman named Polly Shang Kong Ling Fong, who was who was uh, you know a real fighter and and you know quite a, a, a fiery personality on screen. And then um, Wei Ying Hong or Kara Kara Wei Ying Hong sometimes is. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She was a Shaw Brothers actress who's still working in Hong Kong. And she actually studied with Sifu when Sifu was teaching in Hong Kong back in the, back in the seventies. So, Uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I like the old movies. I like the old movies a lot. Of the newer films, uh, you know, I mean, there's a director working now. um, What's his name? Shu Hao Fong. I don't know if you're familiar with his work. He he was uh, he wrote the screenplay for um, Wong Kar Wai's uh, The Grand Master. I, I'm um, not familiar with that one. Okay, okay, but anyhow, Shu uh, Hao Fong is is a a, a kung fu novelist um, in China. He, he seems again he, he seems very well versed in the history of Chinese martial arts, and his his stories always take place in specific historical periods and they they involve like the politics and the martial world politics of that time and his movies are are, are new ones that i i really like and nobody particularly famous in them um although i think he has one coming out pretty soon that has one of the old shaw brothers actors chen kwan tai um starring in it but he, he, I, I think he's doing really good work right now. And, and my dream project would be, you know, Donnie working on a film with him because I think that would be really amazing. But mm. um, right now they're kind of moving in different circles. But it could happen. It could happen. So. How about books? Are you at all a, a reader of martial arts books? Um, Some, yeah. You know, I... I I realized a long time ago that reading martial arts theory for me, it, it doesn't make any sense until I can do it. And once I can do it, I'm not that interested in reading what somebody (laughs) else has to say about it. But I do have to say, I think my favorite book is, is uh, my Sifu's combined Tai Chi, combined Tai Chi Chuan book, which is out of print right now, but you can still find it um, on Amazon sometimes. But she uh, there's just a lot of, it's not just the forms. There's a lot of text in there where she talks about, um, you know, she talks about Tai Chi. She talks about the philosophy behind it, the health benefits. She translates um, some of the classic writings on Tai Chi and does some annotation on them. And there's just a lot of really good um, theory and, and um, you know, it's just suggestions for, for practice um, in that book. 
And and then the the other one that I remember from years ago um, that that was one of the ones that actually made sense to me is is by um, a man who used to teach here in Boston, P. T. Liang. I don't know if that if that name rings a bell. It doesn't. But he, yeah, he he was he was teaching. He was he was quite elderly in in the seventies when I first came to Boston. He was still teaching, and then retired and, and he passed on a long time ago, but he has a book called Tai Chi Chuan for health and self-defense. And it's, it's not a book about here's my form and how to do it. It's just essays on, um, on how to, again, how to practice Tai Chi and, you know, some of the visualizations and, and connections that you can um, feel while you're, while you're going through your, your practice. So, um, uh, those are a couple that that I've gone back to over the years, and and always found something inspirational in them. Mm. Okay, well, let's talk about you again. Let's talk about what's keeping you going. You've been training for quite a while, and at a higher level, a more intense level, which is kind of ironic to say as we're talking about Tai Chi, than most people. So I've got to ask. Why? Why are you still actively training? You're teaching. What is it that you're working towards? Is it a particular goal or is there, there something else keeping you motivated? Well, I think, you know, my goal is, and I actually, sometimes I think of it in, in these exact terms is I, I want to try to um, master as much of the food style technique as I can before I die. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> that's the goal. Okay. I, I don't expect to get it all, but uh, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm still training. I'm still trying to advance the art. Uh, you know, when you when you make those connections, it's it's another treasure from the treasure box. I really like that image, but because that's that's how you feel. Like, oh man, I've been I've been I've been watching Sifu do that all these years, and now I'm able to reproduce just a little bit of that, and I I know how to do it now, and and that's just so exciting. I mean, that's I think that's what keeps me. Um, it keeps me working towards learning a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more feeling, you know, just having that, that control of what goes on in your body, uh, to, to that degree is, um, it's almost addictive in a way. That's why I said, I can't understand why, why everybody isn't doing it because it's, you know, we all live in our bodies and why wouldn't you want them to to work and move as, as efficiently as possible. And so that's essentially what I, I keep doing. I just keep trying to find ways to make it better, better, better. And um, I'm lucky enough to have some, some friends and, and some, you know, people I practice with and train with that share that point of view. And um, anybody else that wanders in would probably think we're crazy. That's all we talk about, but um, it works very well for us. So I guess it's just yeah, just wanting to wanting to attain as close a state to perfection as I can. As long as I can keep doing this art, I'm going to keep working towards that ideal. I love it. Now's your opportunity. If someone wants to reach out, maybe they're nearby or they're coming to visit, or you know they're training three states away and they've been looking for a woman to teach them. You know, how would someone get a hold of you or, or find you online? You know, what, this is what we sort oh, okay. of call commercial time, you know, so, so. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. you can, you can reach me through the, um, Bosa Mark Tai Chi Arts Association website. If you send an email, um, through the website that I, I always check that account to see, um, what's coming in. That's probably the best way to reach me, um, I don't always, I, I, I do the school's Facebook page too, but I don't always respond to Facebook queries just because I get too busy. Um, but through the school website, and it, I think that's um, taichiarts.com, or you can just look up both and Mark, and I think it'll come up as one of the first listings on Google. Okay, and we'll certainly link that in the show notes. Uh, yeah. Also kickmarshmarchradio.com yeah. again for those that yeah. might have missed yeah. it. 
So it, can I can I just say um, wh- where I'm teaching? Well, okay, yeah. where I'm teaching right now, I, I I have classes just about every day of the week. I, I teach on Monday and Thursday mornings at the Dorchester YMCA, and I I teach on Saturday mornings um, in in Cambridge in Porter Square through a senior program called the Living Well Network. I also have an informal Thursday afternoon senior class. That that's the one where they're all in their 80s or 90s because we've been working together for like over 20 years that's in so that cool. group. Yeah, yeah. And then I I teach in Chinatown. I teach about four or five classes a week in Chinatown, um, uh, in in different locations, but uh, usually under the auspices of, of Sifu School. Our main classes now are are um, um, I don't even know if I should say this, but they're in her condo building. Um, so she comes downstairs and practices with us when she's in town. Um, but we, we just rent the function room in, in, in that building. And, and that's where we meet on Tuesday afternoons and Sunday mornings. And, and then we have another space as, as backup that we use for some other classes. Sounds kind of full circle to me. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. And we also, like I said, we have we have seminars. We have Su Yin come in and do the Qigong seminars. Um, we have um, some of Sifu's old students will come in and do seminars on whatever topics they're interested in. Um, and once a month, I do a Sunday morning seminar in Chinatown on on Leng Yi, which is the the Tai Chi Pakwa combination form that that I mentioned before. And uh, nice. yeah, so so there's uh, yeah the, we. It's it's not all day every day like it was when, when Sifu was um, young and and you know full of energy. Now everybody's sort of contributing part time, and uh, but we, we we keep it going. We keep our school going. We just celebrated the 40th anniversary last year, and uh, a lot of her students came from all over. She has students teaching in in Europe and and um, in, in Asia too. So. Just, it's a it's a a far flung group. A lot of very accomplished people, and yeah. as I said, every every single one of them remembers her uh, with a great deal of fondness and respect. Yeah, uh, it's it, it was it's it's just been wonderful being part of that that lineage, you know, because it's 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 a real. It's a real kung fu school that you know, with the pictures of the ancestors on the walls and everything. It's like really just like the movies. If you're a fan of the movies, it's you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, oh, so cool. I really appreciate your time on the show today. I want to thank you for being so open and telling such absolutely amazing stories, listeners. I'm I'm sure you've enjoyed this, and I'm hoping you might send us out with some some great parting words. Oh, okay. Let me see what I can think of. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, well, okay. Actually, not my words. I'm going to give you one of Sifu's favorite sayings about about Tai Chi and about Wushu or Chinese martial arts in general. Um, she would always say that, that um, it should be a, a, a sport, a health exercise, and a performing art. And what she meant by that was that you know you can look at all of these as as martial arts as combat that's the sports side but also it should be good for your body so that's the health exercise and it should also look very elegant that's that's the performing arts aspect so she that that was a, again a, a phrase that she would use a lot when people would ask her what her school was about or what what is the art for and that she thought all three components were important that you should, you should understand what she called the intent, the martial side of it. Um, you should feel what's good for your body and, and practice it as a matter of routine for the health exercise, but it has to look good too. If, 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 you know, you're not doing the full extension of the arms, getting that elegant line, um, she said that your circle becomes like a moon that's not quite full. So she really want she she was really um, concerned that the 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 appearance of the movement that it looks balanced that it looks graceful that sort of shows that the inside is also um, very 
balanced than, you know, that you're feeling it from deep inside. I've exchanged a lot of emails with Sifa Lukish, both before and after our recording. She's been quite the supporter in making connections with other potential guests, and I really appreciate that. I had a great time speaking with her for the show, and we even kept talking a bit after we were done recording. There are some events coming up where I might get to meet her, and I truly hope so. Thank you, Sifa Lukish, for coming on the show today. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find the show notes with some of the best photos we've ever posted. All those names that I mentioned before, all the names that you heard during the interview, we've got quite a few photos there. Check it out. Find Whistlekick on social media. We're at Whistlekick on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and just about everything else. You can also check out the show's Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes. Just search for it and it's going to come up. Find the newsletter sign up at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com or whistlekick.com. That's it for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.